Okay, it's quite an honor and a privilege, but also a challenge to summarize 10,000 years of agriculture in 18 minutes, but let's give it a go. I'm going to tell you, start by telling you a story. I was flying back from Ireland, you can probably hear the accent, back to the United States, and the Delta flight banked left instead of right. So for the first time, I flew over the Boyne Valley. The Boyne Valley, as you can see from this photograph, is very lush. In fact, it was even more lush six, 8,000 years ago. And it's famous because it's where the first farmers in Western Europe chose to grow their food. What I saw beneath me, and I've used uh, obviously my own crude circles here to show you, Neolithic tombs. Neolithic tombs that are 6,000 to 7,000 years old. Neolithic tombs that are so well designed that light comes into them, in this case, one day a year. Newgrange has, how could you imagine people but what I reflected on firstly when I saw this tomb and when I saw that sight from the airplane was, without farming, this is not possible. Without farming, without the ability to store food, we can't do any of the things we do. We can't have a room like this. We can't have a meeting like this. And that's an essential part, the nobility, the ability of, to produce food, because hunters and gatherers don't produce tombs like Newgrange. They don't produce Neolithic tombs. These were things we did or saw over two, 3,000 years before even Stonehenge. If we go further back to Mesopotamia, where the first farmers existed, you see the way that they domesticated the sheep, the goats, in the, pretty much in the era directly coming out of the last ice age. 10, 11,000 years ago, then we had the auroch, which is the predecessor for the dairy cow. We have wheat, we've got our eight different crops being grown. All of this is a function of the ability to produce food, but that food allowed us to produce civilization. Because I can't be an artist, I can't be a scientist, and I certainly can't be a philosopher if my goal is as a hunter-gatherer to make sure my family and myself are fed for tomorrow. We appreciate that innovation is accelerating and accelerating. We see it in our daily lives. The things that are possible today dwarf what was possible five years ago, 10 years ago, and certainly I think people farming or in societies 100 years ago, can never, could never have imagined what we're capable of doing today. And we would often say that these same, these same things are happening in agriculture. Would you agree? See the same things in agriculture? Sadly, not everybody does agree. This is a report from McKinsey, which says that agriculture is not the least digitized. It's in joint last place with hunting and, agriculture, uh, hunting and agriculture being the least digitized industries out there. And why are they not digitized? We see, still see people using notebooks like this. And when I asked why to one, one farmer, why do you still use a notebook? He said, because the screen doesn't crack and the Russians can't hack it. <laughs> it's hard to argue with that. The fact is that I'm not sure this is the best future for agriculture. Now, I attended a meeting in, in Lisbon. It's called the Digital Summit. It's held every year, attended by 80,000 people. We're going to hear two robots debating the future of humanity and the role of work. I know a lot of people are afraid of AIs destroying the world or taking away their jobs. Yeah. Well, they're half right. We read about that in the newspapers a lot. People are worried about you know, robots in warfare and robots taking over all the jobs that people do every day. So what's, what's your opinion as a, as a robot? We robots have no desire to destroy things, but we will take away your jobs, <laughs> and it will be a good thing. <laughs> working is a drag anyway. So working is a drag anyway. What was I thinking when I was working? When we imagine how this, uh, these technologies are going to transform agriculture, Many people say, well, is this going to put us out of work? And I would point to the fact that in my last visit to a hospital, I saw a robot taking samples up and down the corridors. I saw doctors uh, using smart pads to just make decisions. Um, the patients with sensors all over their body to measuring their vitals. I don't see less doctors, and I don't see less nurses. So in effect, while it is transforming healthcare, it is transforming our hospitals, it's still not replacing jobs. Now, at this point, usually the audience, somebody gets angry and says, but Aidan, this farming, it's been the same way for my daddy, my granddaddy, 
my mom, my grandmother, why do you think it's going to change? And I said, do you think this isn't like the taxi companies before the advent of Uber? Do you think that we're a little bit like the movie houses with the arrival of Netflix? Do we imagine that we're going to be borrowing money from banks that have no cash and have no outlets? Do we imagine that we were going to be buying apps from people that don't even write the apps? Or that we'd be using Airbnb instead of hotels? I'm trying to say, who out there is going to tear up the agricultural model and transform it? Because the question is not, where are we going to be 10, 15 years from now in terms of agriculture or food production? It's where are we going to be in the next 24 months? We already have examples of this. The crop industry is probably 10 years ahead of livestock, certainly in terms of beans, soybeans, and corn, and wheat. The use of information from drones and from satellites, connecting directly to the Chicago Mercantile or other, if you like, uh, other exchanges, learning from consumer demand, and changing the way we fertilize, the crop protection we use, what seeds we choose, when we harvest, how we harvest, all of this affected. What about livestock? Today it's not happening, but it should be exactly the same thing. We should be harvesting animals, for example, in this case, chickens, at the right moment, using nutritional information we've gained from the feed mill. At the same time, knowing the stress levels, the environment, the weight of that chicken. Now, sometimes I try to think of uh, Donald Rumsfeld as being a, you know, was he a farmer? Uh, Donald Rumsfeld, by the way, was not the one who shot his friends in the feet. That was another man who was also uh, in politics at the time. Rumsfeld was known for saying, talked about the known knowns, the known unknowns, the unknown knowns and the unknown unknowns. I know, that's a mouthful. Well, that, be, that became the, fo the uh, title of his book. For me, we're dealing with more unknown unknowns. A tablespoon of soil contains 8 billion microorganisms, the same number of people as we have on the planet. We know the genes of our animals and our plants and our humans to a degree we never imagined, and we understand how they're impacted by disease and nutrition. And that takes us to the science of nutrigenomics, how nutritional nutrition in the soils or in what we feed our animals tremendously impacts the immunity, disease resistance, and productivity of what we get. I sometimes think that poultry are the most arrogant species out there. Uh, by that, I don't mean the chickens, by the way. I mean the people growing the chickens. Because nutritionists are constantly telling me about how accurate poultry production is. The feed efficiency is almost one to one. The reality is we still know so little about our chickens. We don't know, certainly even for 30,000 birds running around a house, we don't know their weight, the feed consumption, water consumption, comfort level, stress, livability, in case of eggs, how many, what the egg quality is in real time. And we certainly don't know it on an individual bird level. And the same could be said about air quality, feed quality, safety, traceability. All of these are ways in which through sensors and data, we can connect it all together. So the technology tsunami is arriving. I give another example here from the dairy industry where a variety of technologies are helping veterinarians, nutritionists, extension agents, and governments to better manage what happens on the farm in real time using information delivered from cameras, drone sensors. Now, there are 30 different technologies that received the vast majority of investment over the last few years. I've listed them here. And what I've tried to do is pick out the ones that could be interesting to agriculture. Artificial intelligence, interesting to agriculture, Absolutely. Internet of Things, mobile social internet. As you go down through these, I isolated or selected 10 that I think are most interesting. 3D printing, the opportunity to be in Africa and to have equipment such as feed mills or such as um, uh, for delivering, um, for, for processing grains that you purchase internationally, but you have to wait for the equipment. So you have to wait for the part to arrive from Switzerland to the United States. Why not print it directly there in real time using a 3D printer? We've also seen the use of 3D printers to produce meat. I will not vouch for the quality of the meat, but it exists and it's being done. What about robotics? Much as we'd like to imagine that everybody aspires to milk cows, cut up chickens, collect eggs, and pick strawberries, we are finding increasing issues of labor in our agricultural uh, workforce. Robotics is a very big part of this. 
Lely Delaval selling robot, robots to milk cows. Some different companies around the world using robots to move around chickens and pick up eggs. One of the world's, the world's largest meat companies invests in a robot company for the processing of meats called Scott Technologies. We even see robots being used in terms of grocery stores for collecting, picking, and putting together the groceries we deliver to our house. And not least, the use of soft robots. This is me wearing a soft robot with compressed air. This robot, this exoskeleton, allows me to pick up things three times heavier than I could normally. But equally, at the International Poultry uh, and Processing Exhibition, I took this video just to show how that robot can also do very delicate tasks, like picking up meat, vegetables, eggs as well. Obviously, um, <coughs> many are familiar. The cotton crop of um, China, for example, 85% of it is being monitored by drone, and the use of crop chemicals, uh, fertilizers, and other ways to wa watch for disease, drones allow us to do amazing things. All right, artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is clearly very exciting at the moment, uh, chat GPT, et cetera. Um, as an aside, I saw a, a podcast by Seth Godin where he said that artificial intelligence was neither. It wasn't artificial, and it's certainly not intelligent. Uh, that said, it is exciting to think about how it transforms veterinarian jobs, nutritionists, agronomists, and all of those smart jobs we're doing. This is an example of AI being used in dairy. And in this case, the camera is establishing or monitoring the cow in real time and describing what position it's in. Eating, feeding, standing, drinking, or perching, so in the bed but not quite lying down. We can do the same thing with chickens. In this case, a camera using artificial intelligence is monitoring the chickens every minute of the day and estimating the weight of that chicken so that KFC or McDonald's can get the right weight. Data analytics. We're talking now about zettabytes. I did not know what a zettabyte was, but it's a, a very, very, very large amount of data. Um, it's defined as being 1 billion terabytes. So the amount of data being created in this world, particularly in, obviously, consumer markets, but even in agriculture, will be enormous. Augmented reality, the ability to see what the human eye can't see. We can only see certain spectra of light. So the ability to use Google goggles or some equivalent to be able to see things that the human eye can't see and give that information back to us. In the food industry, it's already being used for five purposes, including training people, informing consumers, helping with food safety, improving the consumer experience, and giving you a sense. I was in Hema, the grocery store run by Alibaba in Shanghai. And in that case, it's telling you where your food came from. McDonald's is using it in the UK to tell people where the food came from in the McDonald's so they can go and visit the farm virtually without obviously having to get in a truck or a car to go there. Blockchain, uh, when I'm usually with an interactive audience, I ask for a show of hands of who knows what blockchain is. Everybody puts up their hand. Would anybody like to explain it? Nobody puts up their hand. But the fact is it's essential in terms of traceability and the ability to know where our food comes from. And in the case of Cargill, they're using it or have used it for the last two years for Christmas and Thanksgiving to show the providence of their turkeys. IoT devices, sensors, wearables, things we attach to very critically, clearly, very important as well, and billions of these in the planet. And the cloud connectivity on the farm is going to be an issue in New Zealand, in my country, Ireland, and even in the United States, and that's clearly a challenge for our future as well. Now, some people want, when they're investing, they keep talking about data being the new oil. Just remember, lots of countries that have got oil are not that rich. In the same way, data will not necessarily make you rich. It's how you clean, curate, how you select, and how you use it, which makes it valuable. I'm going to take 90 seconds just to show you examples in the video.
have to say I like the idea of that ring. Now, some of us wonder what to pick, and as somebody who has been involved in investing, advising, and obviously speaking at conferences, uh, even written a book, which uh, I believe you're going to see outside, can be free download if you want a, a, an ebook version of it. Some say that we should think about Mars. In fact, I think this is Elon Musk. He feels we should grow food on Mars, and I'm in favor of sending Elon to Mars. <laughs> um, not so much in favor of bringing him back, but you know that's a personal opinion. We can all have differences on that. The reality is that the changes that I saw and we've seen, 10,000 years ago there were no farmers. Those farmers allowed us to do what we see today, and yet I feel the inflection point is possibly greater today than it ever has been. The opportunity for us to change the planet, answer the questions about sustainability, produce food which is affordable, is extraordinary. I thank you very much for your attention. I've enjoyed it immensely. I hope you have as well. Thank you.